weirdness so we can get into the weirdness and complexity that is Margaret Sanger. Uh, she, this is the first time that I have really, uh, that I've talked about her, that I have researched her. Um, she's a complex human being and I do, I do feel like I want to do a lot more. Um, I'm going to be referencing some books. Uh, this one, Women of Valor, I did not read all of this. <laughs> um, but this is by Ellen Chesler, so I am going to be referencing this book. Um, and then the live, and this is in the library, by the way. So the Gals Guide Library does have this available to check out for free. And then we do also have this book, Margaret Sanger, A Life of Passion by Jean Baxter as well. Um, so we have two different books on Margaret Sanger. And then another book that I will be referencing, especially an NPR interview with Jill Lepore. Uh, she wrote The Secret Life of Wonder Woman. This is fascinating stuff. Also in the Gals Guide Library. Um, this also actually goes into a good bit of detail with Margaret Sanger and how she ties into Wonder Woman specifically. So if you're kind of more interested in the Wonder Woman suffragette Margaret Sanger kind of inspiration, this is a great book for you. If you're more interested in the Margaret Sanger, um, her life and her story, Gals Guide has two books about her. There are many, many more, including an autobiography actually by um, Margaret Sanger as well. So you can hear um, in her own words. And she did publish books. She did also publish letters and collections um, and things like that too. So if you are interested because she is complex, um, I will also say she's a very hated woman. She started Planned Parenthood and birth control. So there's also a lot of books about how terrible she is. I'm just putting it out there. It's the way it works when you're polarizing. So let's let's get into this, shall we? Let's have some let's have some fun. Let's learn some things. Let's uh, <laughs> try to form some opinions because I'm still working on mine. Um, so I am Dr. Leah Leach. I am your headmistress of the Wonder Woman Academy, and I am the founder of Gals Guide. Today we are going to talk about uh, the Wonder Woman inspiration of Margaret Sanger. So Margaret coined the term birth control, uh, and she is one of the founders of Planned Parenthood. In her time and today, she is very polarizing, uh, and that creates a dynamic love and hate with a little bit of gray area kind of in between. So I did not think it was going to be that hard to actually research her. But there's a lot of information about Margaret Sanger, which is why I thought she would be relatively easy to research, because there's a lot of information. Um, I have lots of sources that I can check and double check. Um, but so much of the research is painted with one extreme over the other. She was either the ultimate saint and the ultimate feminist to all women, or she was the devil herself. Like, you know, these... These are the dynamics that you get when you start to research her, and they seem to be, a lot of them, not all of them, filtered through one lens or another. And that's something that I look at when I am researching of what lens is this filtered through? Is it filtered through, this is who she is, warts and all, you know what I mean? Um, or these are the facts, this is what it is, or she's glorious, or she's terrible, you know, like I, I do look for that. Um, as most human beings, uh, the truth is probably in between. Not absolutely perfect and not absolutely terrible. I don't know. It's how close to which side you're on. But most human beings are a little bit of both. Uh, a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. We have good days, we have bad days, we have good choices, we have bad choices. Um, so I'm not gonna steer away from it though. Um, I will say, and the reason why I'm bringing this up, it is hard to separate spin um, from fact, with Margaret Sanger, it really kind of is. So I'm just kind of prefacing, I did my damnedest, and we shall see. So we're going to look at the facts of her life first. We're going to get into her life and her history. And then we're going to look at William Marsden, who created Wonder Woman, and how he incorporated his friend Margaret into the characteristics of Wonder Woman. So we're going to look at both. 
So Margaret Sanger herself was born in New York in 1879. She had 10 brothers and sisters, and those were the children that survived. Uh, Margaret's mother, Anne, had several miscarriages. Um, I saw some reports of upwards of seven miscarriages throughout her life. Uh, Margaret and her family were Irish, they were Roman Catholic, her father was a stone mason who seemed to like to drink more than he liked to work. <laughs> so Margaret kind of ran away uh, to a college to become a nurse. Like as soon as she could basically get out of the house, um, she did, and she became a nurse. In 1902, she married an architect, William Sanger, and they had three kids together. A few years later, after they got married, Margaret moved to Greenwich Village in New York City. Uh, Greenwich uh, was and is a very fun center of new ideas and expression. So this was in 1910 that the Sangers were there in Greenwich Village. And at that time, uh, Greenwich was really focusing on radical politics. That was kind of the vibe that was going on in Greenwich at the time. Later, there's going to be comedians like Lenny Bruce, and even later, there's going to be folk artists like Bob Dylan. So Greenwich Village, anything coming out of there um, is usually the seeds of a brand new idea and a new movement. Um, so Greenwich in Margaret's time had folk writers like Upton Sinclair and anarchists like Emma Goldman. Um, and Margaret and William, they really, they plugged into the scene, man. They like really were living in Greenwich and living in the radical politics of their time. Uh, Margaret joined the Women's Committee of New York Socialist Party. She also joined the Liberal Club. Uh, she started participating in strikes, especially those that supported the Industrial Workers of the World Union. So she was very active. In 1912, while she was working as a nurse on the Lower East Side, she started her own newspaper column called What Every Girl Should Know. And I actually saw this on Amazon. There's a collection of, uh, of these stories, these columns that she put together in a book of What Every Girl Should Know. And it was about sex education in the newspaper. Uh, she did this because her work at the hospital, she was seeing a number of women who were trying to self-terminate their pregnancies through shady back alley clinics or on their own, right? Um, so uh, she thought about her own mother's health struggles with multiple healthy and unhealthy pregnancies. Her own mother, Margaret's mother, died at the age of either 40 or 50. I saw different reports. Um, and Margaret believed that her mother died at age 40 or 50 because of the simple toll on her body with upwards of 18 pregnancies. Being pregnant 18 times can have a toll on you. So Margaret was compelled to help the unnecessary suffering of women relating to pregnancy. And she fought to make birth control information more available. First, it started with information. Um, she also wanted to make a magic pill that would be used to control pregnancy. That would have to wait, but that was one of her dreams. So until that time that such a pill could be created and be available to women, uh, she said, quote, no woman can call herself free until she can choose consciously whether or not she will be a mother. That was her stance. Uh, her newspaper column expanded, uh, went into a pamphlet. A pamphlet was a, a very big deal in those days. <laughs> if you were Hamilton fans, uh, the Reynolds pamphlet, it's basically like a novella sort of thing. Um, but her pamphlet then expanded into her own publication. She published The Woman Rebel in 1914, and that was a monthly magazine. And that was about the women's right to have birth control. Now, this was not legal at the time to do this. Uh, there was the Comstock Act of 1873, and that prohibited the trade circulation of, quote, obscene and immoral materials. It was illegal to publish medications or contraceptions to control pregnancy and to even mention abortions through the mail. 
illegal. So my guess is that her earlier column was either subtle, where her magazine was not, <laughs> or it was not sent through the mail, because that's different. So Margaret was in jeopardy of facing possible five years of a jail sentence, so she fled to England. Now, at least that's what a lot of uh, biographies and articles say, is that she fled to England. But I read a New York Times scan from 1915, from the New York Times, and it talked about the trial of her husband, William Sanger. It said, while Will William Sanger was being arrested, that Margaret was already abroad. So she might have actually already been in England, and when all of this went down, she just kind of stayed there to lay low, or she might have fled, like a lot of uh, reports say, biography says she fled. Um, but she was already abroad when William Sanger gave a pamphlet of family limitation that Margaret wrote. He handed it to a Comstock Act agent. Undercover sting operation trying to get them arrested. So William's trial was a big brouhaha. This was the New York Times scan that I read all about this fantastic trial. Uh, the headline in the New York Times read this, disorder in the court as Sanger is fined, justice ordered room cleared when socialist and anarchist hoot the verdict, defending birth control, prisoner accuses Comstock of violating the law and goes to jail rather than pay. So that's like the title of this thing. So Anthony Comstock of the Comstock Act was actually in the courtroom. Like he was taking this thing personally. Uh, the case was very heated between Comstock and William Sanger. The little boys got personal. I believe there were some threats of death on both sides. <laughs> Margaret wrote in, Margaret wrote the pamphlet, so it's her writing. Uh, but William was on trial because uh, an agent came in saying he was a friend of Miss Sanger uh, and he was there to pick up that pamphlet. And so he handed it to him. Uh, so it sounds like a little bit of entrapment if you ask me. But uh, William was sentenced to pay a fine of $150 and to serve 30 days in jail. But William shouted, quote, I will never pay the fine. I would rather be in jail for my convictions than to be free at a loss of my manhood and my self-respect. Then there was like a whole bunch of clapping and cheering and then a whole bunch of like angry people, you know, because, you know, that's how it works. So um, while Margaret was in England, she used her time very wisely. Uh, she worked with the women's movement over there and she was researching. She learned other forms of birth control like diaphragms and she smug smuggled one back into the country because it was illegal to have anything go through the mail that's contraceptive. So um, that's also what kind of makes me think that she was probably already there when all of this trial stuff happened. Um, because a lot of stuff happened uh, very quickly in England. But also, when she was in England, William wasn't there with her, and the couple did actually decide to divorce almost a year later. Um, she was also in England getting really woke to the ideas of free love. She was she was into the free love. Uh, so she was apparently sleeping with psychologist Havenlock Willis, and the writer H. G. Wells, yes. And this is according to biography. This isn't like a spicy gossip column or anything like that. So uh, Margaret was having some fun. All right, so she was only in England for a year before she returned to New York because the charges against her were dropped, actually. The conviction was reversed on the grounds that contraceptive devices could be legally promoted to cure and prevent disease. So once it became more about helping diseases, it was seemed to be okay-ish. Uh, so she started touring and openly promoting birth control before she opened her own clinic in 1916. She knew that the clinic was going to get her in trouble. That was really going to be the line. Um, she actually promoted it in the paper that there was going to be an open clinic. Another report said that she sent invitations to the police department of when they were going to be open. <laughs> 
it was it was not a secret that she was going to open, and it was not a secret that she knew this was illegal. So her and her staff were arrested nine days after opening the clinic, kind of expected. Uh, the charge was providing information about contraception and fitting women with diaphragms. That was the bigger exception. Uh, so it was going to be 30 days in jail for breaking the Comstock law. Uh, they appealed and they were made an exception uh, because doctors could prescribe contraception to their patients for medical reasons. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen um, some of the older documentaries or some of the older movies where the woman wants to go and have an abortion and she goes to her friendly doctor and her friendly doctor says, so do you think, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that having another baby would endanger your health, wink, wink, nudge, nudge? Medical reasons. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, so five years after her arrest for opening her clinic, uh, she established the American Birth Control League that would later turn into Planned Parenthood. All right, so first it was the American Birth Control League that she started. Margaret would be president from 1921 to 1928. Uh, she opened the first legal birth control clinic in the United States thanks to, uh, thanks to funding from her new husband, who was an oil businessman named J. Noah H. Slee. So sometimes you might see videos of Margaret Sanger, like especially if you see British Pathé films, um, they'll say Margaret She, Slee, Slee, sorry. Um, and it confused the crap out of me at first. I'm like, because that's her face. That's her voice. <laughs> that's who they're talking about. So Margaret Sanger, Margaret Slee uh, is the same person. She got married. Uh, in 1930s, Margaret turned her attention to the legal side of the birth control issue. Uh, she started the National Committee of the Federation Legislation for Birth Control, and she fought to allow birth control devices to be imported into the country. All right. In the 1950s, uh, she really started concentrating on the magic pill idea and making that a reality. She recruited Gregory Pincus, who was a reproduction expert, and she got funding from Catherine McCorrick who is the heiress to the International Harvester Fortune. So this work would actually lead to, um, I'm not sure actually how you say it, Ovid, Envided, uh, Invited, I'm not sure. Uh, but the first oral contraceptive, the first pill basically that was available and it was FDA approved in 1960. In 1965, the Supreme Court made birth control legal for married couples in the case of Griswold versus Connecticut. And Margaret died a year later after that Supreme Court case, September 6, 1966. That's a little too many sixes for some Christians to really be able to handle. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, so let's switch over to the, the Wonder Woman part of this. So how did Margaret Sanger um, become an inspiration for Wonder Woman? Um, well, just in case you missed the Wonder Woman 101 class, uh, the comic was created by William Moulton Marsden. He wrote under the pen name for a while of Charles Marsden. Same dude. He was in a polyamorous relationship. He was married to Elizabeth, and they had a girlfriend, Olive Byrne. Well, Olive's aunt was Margaret Sanger. So that's, that's the obvious connection right there, that that's her aunt. Uh, but the inspiration actually goes a little bit deeper. So from Jill Lepore, uh, she did an NPR Fresh Air interview that is uh, really, really good. I should send the links. Um, she talked about how in the fall of 1911, William Marsden was a freshman at Harvard, okay? So he's a, you know, newly awoke freshman at Harvard, and he was in the Harvard Men's League for Women's Suffrage, and they invited Emil Pankhurst to the campus to speak. Now, Emile is the queen of English suffragettes, um, and the powers at Harvard 
were very scared. Um, number one, because women were not allowed to actually give speeches and presentations on campus because it's Harvard and it's 1911. Also, this is not just like any woman. This is the woman who is behind convincing other women to chain themselves to government buildings, get arrested, and then go on hunger strikes to protest for the women's right to vote. She was militant um, and she, she would get things done. She really, really would. Uh, so Harvard banned Emile Pankhurst from speaking on the campus. So she came and spoke off campus just across the street. <laughs> That's what you do. Um, so Jill talks about the importance of the use of chains. Okay, so the chains uh, the suffragettes used would appear in Wonder Woman comics. Jill says that chains became a really important signal. So Margaret Sanger at one point published a collection of letters that was entitled Motherhood in Bondage. And it further cements that kind of language of enslavement or chains, etc. So Wonder Woman's creator, William Marsden, who is in a relationship with Olive Byrne, and Olive Byrne's mother is Ethel Byrne. Ethel is Margaret Sanger's sister, okay? So William's girlfriends is basically mother-in-law, though not technically by marriage, <laughs> um, is Margaret Sanger's sister. Ethel was also arrested in Brooklyn when they opened their first birth control set, uh, center. So Ethel was very much part of this. So why is it Wonder Woman based on Ethel, on Olive's mother, right? Well, Ethel was arrested for opening the birth control center. She did go on a hunger strike um, and or to something that to that effect. Um, uh, but what was more important for her, let me see, oh no, here's her quote, there we go. Uh, let me see, let's see. She said something to the effect of, quote, this is more important than the right to vote because women are dying every day in New York from abortions and they can't get contraception. Contraception. I will gladly give my life for this cause. And that is what Ethel said when she was arrested. Well, Margaret, makes a deal with the governor that if Ethel is never again involved in the birth control movement, she can be pardoned and her life can be saved. So as much as Ethel wanted to be a part of the movement, she disappears from it because of Margaret, because of her sister. Could it be her sister is protecting her? Very much could be. Could it that her sister was maybe getting more attention than her. I, I don't know. Sisters are weird. We get to be. It's fine. Um, so in the comic uh, that William Marston worked on, you get to see Wonder Woman organizing working women to go on strike for equal pay with men. That's one of the comics uh, running. You even see her Wonder Woman running for president at one point. Um, you see a lot of feminist stories within the Wonder Woman comic. You also see a lot of chains and bondage. So Jill Lepore once again talks about how William hired an artist to draw Wonder Woman, and that is H.G. Peter. He was the, the first early on illustrator of Wonder Woman. He was influenced by Lou Rogers, who drew editorial cartoons about suffragists. And there would always be this Amazon-like figure breaking chains. So this suffrage kind of look uh, came from Amazon's breaking chains, and that's the artist that you know he kind of drew influence from. Uh, Joy Hummel would help write Wonder Woman comics in the early days. When she was hired on, she was straight up told to read Margaret Sanger's book, Woman, and the new race that was published in 1920. So you start to see this like convergence of Margaret Sanger, suffragette ideas, even suffragette imagery with chains, but then you're also seeing pinup drawings because you know you very much the short skirt and a lot of the poses end up being very much like a pinup drawing. Um, 
And so it's this mix of influences within Wonder Woman. Um, but to get back to the book that one of the writers was asked to use as inspiration, the women of the new race, it is a 76 page book. It's not a, it's not a big book, um, but that book talks about eugenics and it talks about birth control and it talks about them very much intertwined, very hard to separate one from another. So eugenics is complicated, it's racist, it's ignorant, and it's a fearful base system that a lot of powerful people were absolutely entranced by at one point or another in this time period. But I don't shy away from it. Margaret does call mentally ill people in that book defectives. Um, she did support sterilization for the mentally ill. So there is no getting around that. And it's worth mentioning because that is part of her character. That is part of her moral code. Uh, eugenics at the core was about a movement to improve the human species through breeding. And it, it's just, it's just terrible. It's just, it really is. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Alexander Graham Bell, and John D. Rockefeller, among many others, were really outspoken about eugenics. Eugenics was taught in schools. This was not a down low kind of, you know, thought process. It was taught in schools. There was huge exhibits at the World's Fair. Uh, it went on tour like a circus spreading around and then spreading into churches. So churches would even talk about eugenics from the pulpit. They promoted sterilization, much like today we talk about having your pet spayed or neutered. It was kind of in the same tone. It was kind of in the same lack of empathy. Now, 32 states passed eugenic sterilization saying it was okay. So between 60,000 and 70,000 people were sterilized underneath this law. The Supreme Court case of Buck versus Bell is still on the books today. It's a little terrifying. Um, and that law is that a person can be sterilized if they are seen as intellectually disabled for the protection and health of the state. That is still the law that is still on the books. It was really about sterilizing the poor, immigrants, and people of color. It was. It was, it was targeted. Uh, the eugenicists in America only calmed down when they saw how the Nazis incorporated eugenics. Yeah, you know where I'm going with this. Because um, uh, once they, the Nazis took it over, they went, oh, oh, we need to distance ourselves from this. But eugenics did not go away entirely. So in the New Yorker, there's this great article called The Forgotten Lessons of the American Eugenics Movement. And it talks about how after World War II, sterilization remained high. And it talked about how so many poor Southerners underwent a procedure, the procedure of sterilization. It actually had a nickname. It was called the Mississippi Appendectomy. That's actually what the nickname of it was called. It was so common. Even in 2010, female prisoners in California were sterilized without proper permission. It's still, it's still a thing. I mean, it's not as prevalent, but it, yeah, right? So now because of Margaret's connection with eugenics and with Planned Parenthood and with the pill, she is very much targeted by pro-life groups. I mean, the, the girl has a lot of targets on her. Um, so as I was finishing up this class, I was just kind of like looking at my, my final like uh, checkpoints of things to double check and things to research um, and you know making sure I got tabs right and things like that. The New York Times released a story two hours earlier about Planned Parenthood of Greater New York and how they're going to remove Margaret Sanger's name from the building as a founder of the national organization in its Manhattan clinic because of, quote, her harmful connection to the eugenics movement. So Karen Seltzer, the chair of the New York 
uh, board said in a statement, quote, the removal of Margaret Sanger's name from our building, both a necessary and overdue step to reckon with our legacy and acknowledge Planned Parenthood's contributions to historical reduct reproductive hard history with communities of color. Um, Ellen Chester, who is this book, the Women of Valor book, um, she says when asked by, um, uh, oh gosh, New York Times, yes, there we go, for a second I wanted to make sure it was the New Yorker or the New York Times, the New York Times, um, when she was asked about this whole brouhaha um, and removing Margaret Sanger's name from this building and from the, the foundation board, uh, she says that Miss Sanger's uh, has been misinterpreted. She said that Miss Sanger believed in the quality of all children's lives could be improved if they had smaller families. Miss Sanger believed that black people and immigrants had the right to a better life. Her motives were the opposite of racism. So that is Ellen Chester's statement on this. Um, Margaret Sanger herself said, quote, every child should be a wanted child. So I wanted to make sure there was enough time to discuss this complex woman uh, that is Margaret Sanger, because women get to be complex. Um, I think we are far more interesting when we are complex because we can look at uh, the things we love and we can look at the things we hate, but let's not cancel culture on her. Let's not erase her from history. Sure, taking her name off a building, sure. It doesn't erase her from history. Uh, let's learn from her. Let's learn how to be better. That's what I thought we could totally talk about. Plus going, what the hell? <laughs>